Hi everyone, for today's lesson, we are going to learn how to factor quadratics whenever a is not equal to one. Our learning objectives for today is for you to be able to say, I can factor quadratic expressions when a does not equal one using a variety of methods. The method that I do want you to focus on though is guess and check. But I will show you a couple of ways for you to be able to solve um, quadratics and factor them. The next I can statement is I can factor out a GCF. GCF represents the words greatest common factor in order to factor expressions completely. So we can use two methods for factoring polynomial expressions in the form of AX squared plus BX plus C whenever A does not equal one. So in our last lesson, we learned about how to factor when A equals one. And we used a method where we would use um, an X and then we would put it into uh, our parentheses. But this method that is the preferred method of precalculus as well as algebra three with trig is called guess and check. This is the method that I plan to use um, most often in the class. Although if you do find that you like the other method better, that is fine. It'll just take you a lot longer to complete the process. Um, and I will show you whatever way that you end up going about it, but guess and check, this is the preferred method of pre-calc. So what you wanna do, and when it comes to factoring, an expression like three X squared plus eight X plus four, is you want to try to think about how did we get here? What two parentheses did we multiply to get to this trinomial? So I always recommend working with either A or C, whichever value is uh, a prime number. So I'm going to recommend that you work with the prime. And not always will they be prime, so I'm going to write easier. Always work with the prime number or the easier coefficient first. This is typically going to be your A value or your C value. So you decide which one you want to work with. And in this case, if I were to look at the A value and the C value, I'm gonna work with the A value of three first. Now I know that the only way for me to get a three X squared in that first position is for me to split apart three X squared into a three X and an X. That's pretty easy. Now it doesn't matter which one you put in either position. Um, that they're either, it's gonna be the outsider or the insider, but regardless, it will always be in that first position of three X and X. So it really doesn't matter. Next, we will try to guess all of the possible factors of A and C that results in the middle term of B. So what that means is you want to look at the factors of your first term, which is three. And the only way for us to get a three is to multiply one times three. And then we want to look at the factors of four. But a strategy that I would recommend is think about whenever you think about the, what two numbers multiply together to equal four, most of us think of two and two first. And then we think of one and four. So I'm going to recommend that you work with two and two first. And if it doesn't work, then look with uh, work with one and four. Because your goal is to get an eight. And how we're going to get there is we're going to be adding. So we, we are going to be looking at these numbers and trying to figure a few things out. So what you want to do is you are going to um, go 1 times 2 to get a 2 and 3 times 2 to get a 6. Can I get the number 8 from a 2 and a 6? Yes, I can. So what I did here is I multiplied factors of the a value with factors of the C value. And then I have to do some manipulation. I'm either going to work with addition or I'm going to work with subtraction to somehow get my B value. I was able to do that by multiplying one times two and three times two. So the twos that I'm multiplying by are different twos. Just putting that out there. That tells me that I'm not going to be working with the one and the four. So I was asking myself, which combination gives me the middle term of eight? I identified what that is. So what did I do here? 
I multiplied the one, which the one X is the inside term. Remember that this is just a condensed version of FOIL that we are doing. I multiplied the inside term of one X times the number two. So because I have one X on the inside, I'm gonna put a two on the inside since that's what I multiplied by. I wanted that two to be a positive two, so I'm gonna put a plus sign in front of that two. Next, I multiplied three times two. Since three is X is on the outside, I'm gonna put a two on the outside. And since I wanted to get a positive six, the only way for me to get a positive six is for me to have a plus sign. And now I'm going to check my answers. Now, I can check that the first term times the first term is three X squared. And I can verify that the last term times the last term is indeed four. Yes, this is what I wanted. I, I want my first term and my last term to be a three X squared and a plus four, but it's all about that middle term. What is two times X? That is plus two X. And what is three times two? Or three X times two, that's plus six X. Combining my terms in the middle, I end up with three X squared plus eight X plus four. So my insiders multiply together to equal that two X and the outsiders multiply together to equal that six X. And that's what we did over here to accomplish the goal of reaching our middle term of eight. And this method is called guess and check. And even though my explanation took uh, over five minutes to, to go through, this is actually the faster method. Um, it's the most direct, and for the most part, you will find that it is the easier one out of the two as we go along and get into deeper topics in this class. The other method is called Xbox, which is kind of a cool name, but it's an X and foil box. So what we're going to do here is we're going to factor 4X squared plus 16X plus 15. And we're going to work with a familiar territory of an X, but then we're going to take it to the next level and make it a box. So we're going to find two numbers whose product, where we multiply together, equals A times C, and together add to equal our basement, which we call B. Just like we did before with our factoring with just X in our last lesson. So the first thing we want to do is we want to fill in the X as shown here. So in our X, I'm going to take my A value, which my A value in this case is 4, my B value is 16, and my C value is 15. And I need to multiply A times C. So 4 times 15 is equal to 60. Multiplication always goes on top and addition goes on the bottom because we want to figure out what two numbers multiply together to equal our attic and together add to equal our B value, which is the basement, and our B value in this case is 16. So what two numbers multiply together to equal 60 and together add to equal 16? Well, that's a 10 and a 6. 10 times 6 equals 60. 10 plus 6 equals 16. Now, this is a major error that kids make. Please do not do this. A major error is kids will say, oh, cool, my answer is x plus 10 times x plus 6. That's my answer. Woohoo! Um, unfortunately, that is not true, and that's because x times x is x squared, not 4x squared, which is our goal. Therefore, this is not correct, and we are not allowed to do this. So please note that whenever your A value is not 1, you can't just go from your x to your parentheses. We have to do and incorporate an additional step. And that additional step is the box. So what you're going to do is you're going to create a box. And in this box, it's going to be a 2 by 2 because we know that our answer is supposed to be two parentheses that are two binomials multiplied together. In the first position will be 4x squared. That's our first term. Our last box will be our last term. And the sides of our, or the diagonal, is going to be our 10x and our 6x respectively. And we attach x's to them because together they have to equal our middle term of 16x. So we attach x's to the 10 and the 6 and we put them on the side. And now what we want to do is we want to factor 
the greatest common factor from each row and each column, remembering to factor out any leading negatives. So here we go. Looking at um, 4x squared and 6x, what do these two terms have in common? Well, they both have in common a 2. 2 can go into both, and they both share at least 1x. So I'm going to bring an x, a 2x on the outside. What does 10x and 15 have in common? Well, 10x and 15 have in common a 5. So 5 will go on the outside. You can um, work with GCFs for the columns, or you can do a quick trick. And that trick is to say, what times 2x equals 4x squared? That is 2x. 2x times 2x equals 4x squared. Let's verify. Is 4x squared and 10x is the only thing they have in common, a 2 and an x? Yes, that is true. Now ask yourself, what times 5 equals 15? That's a 3. Let's verify. Is 3 times 2x 6x? Yes. And does 6x and 15 have in common a 3? Yes. Cool. So the numbers that we have on the side, they will represent, and at the very top, they represent our parentheses. So in this case, we will have a 2x plus 5 times a 2x plus 3. If we were to multiply this out, we would FOIL and go 2x times 2x to get 4x squared, 2x times the plus 3 to get plus 6x, 5 times 2x to get plus 10x, and 5 times 3 to get plus 15. Combining your like terms, we end up with 4x squared plus 16x plus 15. And cool, we've just verified that our answer is indeed correct. Now this process requires a lot of space on your paper. And um, it requires you to feel very comfortable with working with larger numbers like the number 60. 60, believe it or not, is considered a relatively tame number compared to the kind of numbers that you might see whenever you are working with an Xbox method. And for that reason, the guess and check method is the most preferred method for pre-calculus or Algebra 3 with trig. Please keep that in mind and with the exception of a couple of problems that I'm going to do in class, um, everything is going to be guess and check from here on out. So I'm going to go ahead and start with example number one, and I will go ahead and do an Xbox really quick, and then from here on out, I'm going to do um, uh, guess and check so that you guys can see that in action just a little bit more. So working with my Xbox, I'm going to write A is equal to 3, B is equal to negative 10, and C is equal to 8. My attic is A times C, so 3 times 8, which is 24. My B value is negative 10, and I have to somehow come up with two values that multiply together to equal 24, and together add to equal negative 10. So when I think about 24, I, I immediately thought of like 4 and 6, and I also thought of 2 and 12. So those were the numbers that came to my mind right away. One of these will multiply together to equal positive 24 and together add to equal negative 10. And so because I want that positive 24, that tells me that I need both of these terms to be negative. Negative 4 times negative 6 is positive 24 and negative 4 plus negative 6 is negative 10. Cool. Now I'm going to create a box, and my box, because I know that this is supposed to be a binomial times a trinomial, I'm sorry, excuse me, a binomial times a binomial, I am going to put, um, make this a two by two grid. Eventually we will get into larger grids uh, once we get into uh, further units. But my first box is gonna have a three X squared. My last box will have a positive eight. The sides are going to have negatives, so I'm going to put in a negative 4x and a negative 6x, and these come from the side of my x. Now, it doesn't matter if you put 4x down here or 6x up here. It really doesn't matter because you'll eventually get the same parentheses. And I also want you to note that when it comes to your order of the parentheses, order doesn't really matter whenever you're multiplying as long as what's inside of the parentheses is consistent. So if you, for example, back up here, if you had a 2x plus 3 first 
and a 2x plus 5 second, that's okay because the parentheses and the stuff inside is the same. All right, let's go ahead and look at what we have here. Looking at 3x squared and 6x, what do they both have in common? Well, I know that 3 can go into 6x, so I'm going to make this a 3, and they both share at least 1x, so I'm going to put a 3x up here. Um, what times 3x equals 3x squared? Well, that's going to be an x, so I'm going to put that on the outside. What times 3x equals negative 6x? Well, that's a negative 2, so I'm going to make that negative 2 go on the outside. What times negative 2 equals positive 8? That's a negative 4. And let's verify. What times x equals negative 4x? That's a negative 4. Cool. The sides of my box are my parentheses, so my answer is x minus 2 times 3x minus 4. All right, let's go ahead and um, verify that this actually worked out. So we have x times 3x, which is 3x squared, x times minus 4, which is minus 4x, negative 2 times 3x is minus 6x, and negative 2 times negative 4 is plus 8. Look at there, negative 4 plus negative 6, that's going to get me my 3x squared minus 10x plus 8, and I end up where I started, and that's how you know that you did it correctly. Will I require check steps? No, but I'm going to strongly recommend that you have those incorporated into your homework so you can verify that you actually did your, uh, your homework correctly. Let's go ahead and look at letter B. This is guess and check. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down two parentheses. And somehow I've got to work with the factors of 6 and the factors of 15. I don't know what I'm going to use quite yet, but I do know that 6x squared is going to be some number times x and some number times x. I know that. So I have enough space for a number to go out in front. After that, I really don't know enough, so I'm going to write down factors of 6. Now remember, we always write down factors that we typically use. So we typically use 2 and 3, and I'm going to write down factors of 15, and whenever I think of 15, I automatically think of 3 and 5. So those are the numbers I think about. Go with the ones that we typically use. If they don't work, then that's when you start working with 1 and 6 and 1 and 15. Our goal in this case is to get a positive 1, and that was our B value. So let's go ahead and play around with this. I'm going to multiply 2 times 3. That's going to get me a 6. And I'm going to multiply 3 times 5. That's going to get me a 15. Can I get a 1 from a 6 and 15? No, I cannot. So that is not the right approach. So now I'm going to change it. Instead of multiplying 2 times 3, I'm going to multiply 2 times 5 this time. 2 times 5 is 10. And now I'm going to multiply 3 times 3. So I'm changing it up just a little bit. And 3 times 3 is 9. Can I get a 1 from a 10 and a 9? Yeah, I can. If I went 10 minus 9, I will get a 1. Cool. So I found the right combination. So... I know that 2 and 3 work, so I'm going to put in a 2x and a 3x. I know that it works. I'm not going to be working with a 1 and a 6. So now this is where outsiders and insiders come in. What did I multiply 2 by to get this combination? Well, I multiplied 2 times 5 to get 10. Since I put 2x on the outside, 5 goes on the outside. And because I want 10 to be positive, I'm going to have a positive 5 in that parenthesis. So if I had put the 2x on the inside, 5 would have gone on the inside. So it just depends on where you put things. 3x. I multiplied 3 times 3 to get 9. So 3, since it's on 3x is on the inside, the other 3 will go on the inside. Because I want 9 to be negative, I'm going to make this 3 negative. And now I'm going to verify. 2x times 3x is 6x squared. Negative 3 times 5 is minus 15. Cool. Negative 3x times 3, and I'm sorry, negative 3 times 3x is negative 9x. 2 times 5 is plus 10. That'll give me a positive 1. Cool. There's my answer. 
Let's go ahead and look at letter C. Oh, I love letter C. Alrighty, just because of the fact that we have this 3x squared and the only way for us to get a 3x squared is to multiply 3x and an x. I already know this right away. So I'm going to be working with those factors of 3, which are 1 and 3. But 12, 12 has a couple numbers that, a couple factors that we typically use. Like, for example, I think of, uh, when I think of 12, I think of 3 and 4, and I also think of 2 and 6. Somehow I've got to reach my goal of my B value, which is 5. All right, let's go ahead and see what ends up happening. I'm going to multiply 1 times 3 to get 3, and 3 times 4 to get 12. Can I get a 5 from a 3 and a 12? No, that's not the right approach. So let's try a different way. What is 1 times 4 this time? That's 4. And 3 times 3? That's 9. Can I get a 5 from a 4 and a 9? Yeah, I can. Cool. That tells me that 2 and 6 doesn't work. So how can I get a 5? Well, I would need a negative 4 and a positive 9. And so this is the correct combination to get me my answer. All right, let's go ahead and um, figure out what we did here. So how did we get this 4? Well, I got this 4 by multiplying 1 times 4. And since I put the 1x on the inside and I needed to multiply by 4, 4 is going to go on the inside. And because I want that 4 to be a negative 4, I'm going to make 4 negative. And looking at the 3, I needed to multiply 3 times 3 to get 9. And because I want it to be a positive 9, or sorry, excuse me, a positive 9, I'm going to make this a plus 3 on the inside. All right, let's go ahead and verify. 3x times x is 3x squared. Negative 4 times 3 is minus 12. And then I have uh, my insiders is a negative 4x. My outsiders is a plus 9. 9 minus 4 is 5. So that is my factorization. 3x minus 4 and x plus 3. All of this thinking and work, eventually, I want you to do it all in your head. That's what my goal is for you. And as we are working, you'll find that you will be able to do some of these factorizations in your head. The next three examples are your, uh, your turns, they're team pairs and solos. So this is something I want you to try to complete on your own before coming into class. And then we will go from there. Let's go ahead and look at our factoring patterns. So just like we had before, um, when a was equal to 1, we still have the same exact factoring patterns of difference of two squares, which we call that dots in this class, and perfect square trinomials, which are called PSTs. So our dots looks like this. If you have a squared minus b squared, that is equal to two parentheses. And those two parentheses are the square root of a squared, which is going to be a, the square root of b squared, which is going to be b, and so a and b will go into each, uh, the first and last term of the parentheses. And how do you get a minus? Well, that's a positive times a negative. So that's our uh, difference of two squares. So an example of that would be like example number two. So we have to take the square root of 81x squared. The square root of 81 is 9. The square root of x squared is x. So in our first position, we're going to have a 9x and a 9x. The square root of 25, that is equal to 5. And we address the negative by making one parenthesis have a positive and the other one have a negative. So whenever you see two terms, always analyze to see if those two terms are perfect square numbers. If they are, you probably have a dot. The next type that we have is a perfect square trinomial. And there are two types of perfect square trinomials. There's one that is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, which essentially that middle term is an even number. And if you see that the first term and the last term are perfect squares and the middle term is an even number, that is your clue that this is a perfect square trinomial that will be factored as the square root of a squared is a, the square root of b squared is b, the middle sign is a plus sign, and we square that parentheses. The other type that we have is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, where once again that middle term is an even number again. And its factorization is very, very similar because what you're going to see is like the first and last terms will be perfect squares. The middle term will be a minus even number. 
So the way you factor it is you take the square root of the first term, which is a, the square root of the last term, which is b, but the middle term is going to be a minus sign. So some examples is like letter b. We have our first term is 49z squared. Our last term is 64. Both of those are perfect squares. The middle term is even. Now let me tell you, if you want to do Xbox with these, your attic is going to be 49 times 64. That's 3,136. Nobody's going to want to do the Xbox for these types of problems. This is why it's imperative for you to recognize that the patterns whenever you have them. So because we know this is a PST, we know that our answer will be a parenthesis squared. So the square root of 49 is 7. The square root of z squared is z. Our b term is plus, and the square root of 64 is 8. So your answer is 7z plus 8 squared. Letter C is also a perfect squared trinomial. The first term is 9r squared. The last term is 121. If you had wanted to do the x max method, that's 9 times 121 for your a value or for your attic, and that's 1,089. Nobody wants to work with that number. So therefore, recognize your patterns. So this is going to be a parenthesis squared. The square root of 9r squared is 3r. The square root of 121 is 11. Because our b value is a minus sign this time, we're going to have a minus in between. The next three problems are a team pair solo. So I would like you guys to please go ahead and try those on your own before I see you next time in class. The last thing we want to talk about is factoring out monomials. This is another way of saying factoring out the greatest common factor. So when factoring an expression, always first check to see whether the terms have a common monomial factor. This common monomial factor is called the greatest common factor. Sometimes we call it GCF, and most of the time you will see me call it GCF in this class. Please note that you always factor out in the event that your leading coefficient is a negative. You always factor out a negative value when the leading coefficient is negative. So I'm going to be looking for you to recognize that when you have a leading coefficient that's negative, you're, you're going to want to factor out that negative as well. And that's because you want, especially once we get into more intense uh, problems later on in this class, you're going to want a positive leading coefficient whenever you are factoring. All right, let's go ahead and look at the very first problem. We have 3x squared minus 300. 3 and 300, they both have in common a 3, so I'm going to factor out a 3. My leftovers is going to be x squared minus 100. Oh, look at that. x squared minus, 200, uh, minus 100. That is a difference of two squares. Two terms, both are perfect squares. Great, so to fully factor, factor completely means that you might have more than one step. I'm going to break this apart into two parentheses, and that's going to be an x plus 10 times an x minus 10. Let's look at letter B. 8m squared plus 28m minus 120. They all look like they, have, let's verify. I know that um, 8 can't go into 28, but I do know that both of these terms have in common a 4, and I'm pretty sure that 120 is divisible by 4, so I'm leaning towards 4 being the greatest common factor. Our leftovers is going to be 2m squared plus 7m minus 30. All right, let's go ahead and factor that even further. What's really nice about this one is that we have a, a prime leading coefficient. So this is going to be a 2m and an m. And somehow I've got to look at the factors of 2, which are 1 and 2, and the factors of 30. Whenever I think of 30, I always think of 5 and 6 first before I think of 3 and 10 or 2 and 15. My goal in this case is to get a 7. Now, I'm working with the inside. I'm not focused on what was happening on the outside because I factored out the four. So now my focus is to try to get this new trinomial factored. So my goal in this case is to try to get a seven. 
All right, let's analyze my numbers. I have one times five, that's a five. Two times six is 12. Can I get a seven from a five and a 12? Yeah, if I go negative five plus 12, that equals positive seven. Cool, I found it on the first try. So what did I do here? I went one times five, and since one is on the inside, five will go on the inside, and I want five to be negative, so I'll have a minus five here. And then I multiply two times six to get 12, and I want it to be a positive 12, so I'm gonna put a plus six here. And there is my factorization. A lot of times kids forget the four on the outside. Whatever you do, you need that four because if you were to foil everything back in, you should end up with where you started. The next one I want to talk about in the last example for this video lesson is letter C. And notice in letter C that our first term, our leading coefficient, is negative. And whenever that happens, you want to factor out a negative greatest common factor. So 7 and 63 both have in common a 7, and I'm going to factor out a negative 7. What that's going to do is it's going to change your signs inside, and you're going to be left with, um, excuse me, they both have in common a y as well. So I'm going to factor out a negative 7y because they both have in common a y. And our leftovers is a y plus 9. Now, please, please, please be careful. Just because you see a 9, this is not dots or anything because this is not a difference of two perfect squares. So I'm just going to note that this is not dots. The last problem is yours to complete on your own, and that is the end of today's lesson. If you have any questions over anything, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day.